Hello grade nines, this is Mr. Miller and welcome to lesson 5.2 on equivalent expressions. <clears throat> so first of all, we would like to define we'd like to define the expression like terms. So like terms means the following. So we have terms that have all the same variables raised to the same exponents. Let's determine the value of the coefficient in each expression, and let's also look at the number of variables for each term. So the first one we have here is negative t. And for negative t, it has a coefficient of negative 1. So that's the number that is multiplying out in front of negative t, although the 1 isn't actually written in here, but we understand that if we don't write 1, if we just write negative and then the variable, it's understood to be negative 1. And the number of variables that we have in this term is one. So the only variable is t. Next we have 12. So 12 has a coefficient of 12 and the number of variables that it has is 0. The next one, part e, we can see that b has a coefficient of 1. So again, with a coefficient of 1, we don't write that 1 out in front here. We just don't do that. Just leave it blank. It's understood to be 1. And the number of variables that we have here is 1. So now on to the next column, we're looking at 4d squared. And with 4d squared, the coefficient is 4. And the number of variables is still 1. So you might be looking at the fact that it's d squared and thinking, oh, well, that must mean that there are two variables because it's d times d. But no, in fact, um, those are the same variables, so it's only 1. Next, we have negative 8dE, so the coefficient is negative 8. And there are two variables, d and e. Next, we have negative c squared, and so the coefficient is negative 1. And there is only one variable, which is c. Next, we want to do a little bit of a matching exercise. We want to match the expression with its description by placing the correct letter in the blank. So let's take a look at A. And for A, we have negative 4x. And so let's see if that matches anything here. So negative 4x, is that a constant? And the answer is no. Uh, is it a binomial? No. So it's not that one. Negative 1 is the coefficient? No, that's not the one. Negative 4 is the coefficient? Yes, that's the one. All right, so next we've got 17. Now, rather than go through every single one of these, let's just take a look, see if we can figure out. Yes, of course, 17 doesn't have a variable in it, so this is a constant term. Next, we have 2ab. And 2ab is a monomial with a degree of 2. So the reason for that is that here we have a is to the 1 and b is to the 1. So combined together, that is degree 2. And it is a monomial because it's a single term. Next, we've got 3y squared minus 2y. So this is a binomial this time, but it also has degree 2 because the first term has degree 2 and the second term has degree 1. So overall, we take the bigger number, and that's degree 2. 
So, and it is a binomial, it does have two terms, so this is d right here. Next we've got negative m. So negative 1 is the coefficient. So again, the 1 isn't written, but it's understood to be negative 1 here. Next we've got 5x minus 3y, and hopefully that fits this last description. Last description is a binomial with two variables, and that is certainly the case. So binomial because there are two terms here, and there are two different variables. There's an x and there's also a y. All right, next we want to do some circling of like terms in each group. So taking a look at the first group, we have 4x, 4y, x squared, negative x, and y squared. Go back to your definition for like terms. These are terms that have all the same variables raised to the same exponents. So if we take a look here, notice that 4x has like term with negative x because they both have x in it and they're both raised to the 1. None of the other terms match up for being like terms. So we're going to circle 4x and circle negative x because those are like terms. The other ones are not like terms. You might be looking at the 4y and the y squared. Yes, they both have y in it, but they don't have y raised to the same exponents, so we're not going to include those. Now if we move on to part B, let's see if we can figure out if there are any terms that are like terms. And so if we're starting off with 6, let's see right away looking down to the end of the line here, negative 0.1 is a like term and the reason for that is because they're both constant terms. Neither one of them has any variables and so the race is the same exponent. Um, the 2x is not a like term with anything else. There's no other term that involves x. And the negative 2.5, oh, now the negative 2.5 is also a constant term, so we have to include that. The 3y is not a like term with any of the others because none of the other terms have y in it. All right, moving on to part C. So we've got a, we've got 7a and we've got 1.5a. All of those are like terms. The other terms involve b somehow so they're not like terms. And notice that even these two are not like terms with each other because one has an a in it, the other one does not. All right. So moving right along to part D, we have a negative F, which is not a like term with anything else. We have a 3EF, which is not a like term with anything else. There are no other terms that have both E and F. So it's actually the F squared and the negative 6F squared that are like terms because they both contain F, and both raised to the power of 2. Next we've got part E, and hey, I like to party, so this should be a good one. We have 6st, and next term doesn't have a t in it, so we're not going to include that. We've got a 3 quarters st, so that's a like term, and then we've got a negative st, so that's a like term. Last term has t but no s, so it's not a like term, I'm just going to leave that one alone. And moving on to part F. So we've got PQ, which there are no other terms that have both P and Q in it. We've got a negative 0.6P squared, and I can see that there is another term here that has a P squared in it, the negative P squared, and also the 10P squared. So this is uh, 5Q, it's not a like term with any of the others. So there are no other terms that have just Q in it, not P. All right, and down to part G. 
we have 0.5 j k and I can see there are other terms that have j and k in it so I'm going to include those so the negative j k for instance um, not the j squared because we've got j but we're missing the k and so they're not like terms plus the j is squared there so so we're also going to include 6jk and of course not the k, negative k because it doesn't have a j in it so there you go and finally like terms here so two-fifths or in other words 0 0.4 is a constant term so is 0 0.12 None of the other terms are like terms. We have a one-half r and an r squared. They both have r in it, but one of them has r squared. The other one has r just to the one. So they are not like terms with each other. Ruby. So moving on to the last one on this page, number four, and the instructions are to collect like terms. So first of all, identifying the terms that are like terms and then combining them together. So we have to take a look at all these terms and see if there are any that can be put together. All right. So with part A, we have 3m minus m squared minus 6 plus 3m squared. And so I can see here that my like terms are the following. We have a, a negative m squared that goes with the positive 3m squared there. And so if I combine those together, the 3 plus negative 1 gives me positive 2 overall, m squared. And then we have the plus 3m, and then we have the negative 6. So those two terms don't get changed at all. But again, where I got this 2m squared from was from combining my two like terms. So one thing I should mention is that this is an equivalent expression to the line above, but obviously it's simplified. So sometimes the instructions will say to collect like terms, but it's not to say that they're always going to say that. Sometimes it may say something like simplify. And you can understand why they would say simplify because if you take a look at what results, we have a polynomial that only has three terms to it instead of having four. So it is a little bit of a simpler expression for that reason. In any case, let's go on to part B and take a look at that. So I'm just going to highlight my like terms again. So I've got a negative 4k that can be combined with a 5k. But I also have k squared terms that I can put together. So let's do that. So I've got a negative k squared that I can combine with the negative 7k squared. Typically, we like to order polynomials in the following way. We like to put the terms that have highest order first. So I'm going to put the negative 7k squared together with the negative k squared first. So negative 7 plus negative 1 gives me negative 8 and this is k squared. And then putting together the plus 5 and the negative 4, when you add those two together, it gives you plus 1k. And finally, we have the plus 8 term, which is all by its lonesome. So again, just to recap, we got the k squared term from combining those two like terms in pink. 
and we got the k term by combining the two like terms that were um, k terms. All right, so next we've got part C. And we do, again, have some like terms. So I'm going to combine the negative C with the positive 3C. I'm also going to combine the negative C squared with the positive C squared. So this is a little bit of a special case scenario here because with the plus 1 adding with the negative 1, that adds to 0. So I could write 0c squared, but what's the point in that? It's not there. Um, all that we're left with is just positive 3 plus negative 1, which gives us positive 2c. And again, where I got that from was from combining those two like terms that I had highlighted in yellow. All right, so now moving on to part D now. Um, okay, so starting off with maybe the constant terms, so 7 and negative 10 can certainly be combined together, and also the positive 9, and Let's see what else we can combine together. We've got a 5n and a negative n. Those can be combined together. I've also got an 8n here, and that can be combined together. So now that I'm all color coordinated here, let's put it together. All right, so I've got 5 and negative 1. That would leave me with 4. And adding 8 would give me 12n. And finally, we've got the constant term, which is the combination of the 7 and the negative 10, which would give us negative 3. And adding 9 to that would give us positive 6. So again, we get this um, term involving n by combining our like terms that have n in it. And then our constant term here is gotten by combining all of the um, all of the terms that are constant terms. Moving right along, we have a negative 2b squared that can be combined with a positive 3b squared. We have a negative 7b and a negative 8b that can be combined together and also the positive b. And when I'm done with this, I'm going to let it be, if you know what I mean. All right, so negative 2b. So the negative 2 combined with the positive 3 gives me positive 1b squared. And next we've got negative 7 and negative 8 and positive 1. So negative 7 and negative 8 gives me negative 15. Adding 1 to that gives me negative 14b. All right, so again, color coordinating here. The b to the 1 term um, was gotten by combining the negative 7b and the negative 8b and the negative, uh, sorry, positive 1b. And the first term you get by combining the b squared terms. All right, so moving on to part f, getting lots of practice here. Hopefully this is sinking in for you. If you're getting the idea here, maybe you want to try doing these ahead and then, you know, press pause in the video, try these yourself, and then check your solutions. So I'm going to do this a little bit quicker now. Let's see if we can get it all sorted out. So we've got a w squared term, negative 8w squared, um, positive 7w squared. Okay, so that's going to all combine together to give me. So 1 minus 8 is negative 7. Plus 7 is 0. 
w squared. So I'm not going to write that term. Next, we're going to move on to a different color here. Negative 3w plus 10w. So combining negative 3 with positive 10 gives me positive 7w. Of course, I don't really need to write that positive, but I can if I want. All right, and the last line here of examples. Okay, so with negative 2a combining with negative a and negative 5a, this will give me, so negative 2 take away 1 is negative 3, take away another 5 is negative 8a. All right, and then after that, we need to combine together the negative 1 and the negative 7. And that gives us negative 1, and take away another 7 gives us negative 8. So again, just doing that color coordination here. This is the constant term got, gotten by combining the two constant terms above it and the variable term which contained A from combining those pink ones above it. And finally, we have, let's see, 3s and 7s. We've got constant term 6, constant term negative 8. And then we've got third different kind of term. We've got negative 6s squared and a negative 2s squared. Let's see how it all combines here. So first of all, the first thing to be written down should be the s squared term. Generally we go from highest order to lowest order. So doing negative 6 and negative 2 that gives you negative 8 s squared. Next we've got the um, s to the 1 terms, so that's 3 and 7 is 10. And finally we've got 6 and negative 8 which gives us negative 2. So just highlighting that answer, so we've got the um, s squared terms from combining everything in green. We got the um, s to the 1 terms by combining everything that was in pink. And finally we got the constant term by combining the things that were in yellow. Awesome. Let's take a look at the next page. All right, so the next thing we're looking at, number five here, it says that a rectangle's length is seven centimeters greater than its width W. We want to draw the rectangle and label its dimensions. Okay, so let's do that. I'm going to, first of all, draw a rectangle. And now we are going to label its dimensions. So we're going to call the width w, and we're going to call the length w plus 7. The reason for that is because of the fact that we're told that the length is 7 centimeters greater than the width. 
So this is 7 more than the width. So now we've got the rectangle drawn and we've labeled its dimensions, both the length and the width. Let's write an expression to find its perimeter. So capital P for perimeter, and this is going to be equal to the length, W plus 7, plus the width, which is W. Now that's not the entire perimeter. This just covers these two sides. We also have to add the opposite side here, which is also W plus 7. And finally, we have to add this last little piece here, which is W. Next thing we want to do is we want to collect like terms. And so for the perimeter, in simplified terms, here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to take all those terms that have W in it. So there's a W, there's another W, and there's another W, and there's another one. So in total, we have 4W, which we got from adding all those terms that were highlighted in yellow. And now we just have these two constant terms. We've got a seven here, and we've also got a seven here. So if we add those two terms together, then this would be plus 14. And again, we get that from adding the terms that are highlighted in pink. Those are all the constant terms. Sometimes it's helpful, especially if we're looking to calculate the perimeter of multiple rectangles like this one, um, to have a nice simplified expression for perimeter. So let's take a look at number six now. It says that the cost of publishing the school yearbook was $440. The yearbook committee priced the yearbook at $8 each. We want to write an expression that represents the profit P for the number of yearbooks sold N. Okay. So if we are calculating the profit P, we need to take all of the revenue, we need to take all of the revenue and subtract the cost. So the total revenue is going to be from yearbook sales. So it's $8 per yearbook times the number of yearbooks that can be sold. And then we have to subtract the cost, which is going to be $440. And we're being asked a question about how many yearbooks do we need to be uh, sold for the yearbook committee to break even. So if you're not familiar with the term break even, it means that profit is zero. So let's see if we can work this out. And again, the key here is that breaking even means that profit is equal to zero. So let's see if we can do a little bit of guess and check and figure it out. So let's suppose that n is equal to 40, just as a starting place. Nice big number. Um, well, it's not huge, 40 yearbooks sold. The profit that you would get would be 8 times 40, take away 440. So now if you do that calculation, and um, it's not too difficult to do in your head, 4 times 8 would be 32, so 40 times 8 would be 320. So if we take away 440, you can see that we're actually not going to have a profit, we're going to have a loss in this case scenario, so that would be $120 loss. 
So we don't really want that. That's not what we're looking for. So we need to sell some more yearbooks. So maybe we sell 50 of them. So 8 times 50 and then take away 440. And so 8 times 50 would give us 400. Take away 440 and no, we're still at a loss here of 40. And so that one is wrong as well. I guess I should clarify that that's not what we're looking for. I'm, I'm not using a, a variable x in here. This is not supposed to represent x. I was striking that out because this is not the situation we are looking for. We are hoping to break even, so that means a profit of zero. All right, so guessed around a little bit. Looks like we need to make another $40. Well, 8 goes into 45 times, so we should be able to get... Sorry, I didn't indicate here how many yearbooks were being sold in each case, but this was looking at number of yearbooks sold being 50. And so now I believe I've figured it out that it should be 55 yearbooks that we're selling, and that should give us a profit of zero. So if we do 8 times 55 and then take away 4, uh, 440, that should be equal to zero. So 8 times 50 was 400. 8 times 5 is an, another 40, so that is 440. And so if you take away the 440 in cost, that gives you zero profit. All right. So, just to uh, finish off with a uh, final sentence answer here. So, just going back to read the question. How many yearbooks need to be sold for the yearbook committee to break even? So we should answer with the final sentence, and we can say, therefore, 55 yearbooks need to be sold in order to break even. And that's it. So thank you for watching this video everyone and have a great day.